Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part 13 of Ancient Mystic Oriental Masonry by Dr. R. Swinburne Clymer. Masonic symbolism and the ancient mysteries are one. 207. The order known as Freemasonry appears to have been instituted as a vehicle to preserve and transmit an account of the miraculous dealings of the Most High Priest with his people in the infancy of the world, for at that early period Freemasonry may be identified with religion. 208. The identity of the Masonic institution with the ancient mysteries is obvious from the striking coincidences found to exist between them. The latter was a secret religious worship and the depository of religion, science, and art. Tradition dates the origin of the mysteries back to the earliest period of time and makes it coeval with the organization of society. 209. But the order of Freemasonry goes further than did the ancient mysteries. While it embodies all that is valuable in the institutions of the past, it embraces within its circle all that is good and true of the present, and thus becomes a conservator as well as a depository of religion, science, and art. 210. Without any reference to forms and modes of faith, it furnishes a series of indirect evidences which silently operate to establish the great and general principles of religion, and points to that triumphant system which was the object of all preceding dispensations, and must ultimately be the sole religion of the human race, because it is the only religion in which the plan of salvation is clearly developed. 211. From age to age, through countless generations, these rites have read their sublime lessons of wisdom and hope and peace and warning to the sons of light. These same lessons, in the same language, they read to us today, but do we see in them what they did? Do they impress us as they did them, or do they pass before our eyes? like a panorama of some unknown land, which has no delineator to tell us what or where it is, or give us any intelligible notion regarding it. Accepting the symbol, have we lost its sense? Our rights will be of little value to us if this is the case. It is our duty then to make Freemasonry the object of a profound study. We must consult the past. 2.12 we must stand by the sarcophagus of the murdered Osiris in Egypt, enter the caverns of Phrygia, and hold communion with the Kaba'a, penetrate the Collegia Fabrorum of ancient Rome, and work the mystic circles of Sidon. In a word, we must pursue our researches until we find the thought that lay in the minds of those who created the institution and founded our mysteries. Then we shall know precisely what they mean we shall see in them a grand series of moral and philosophical dramas, most eloquent and instructive, gleaming with sublime ideas as the heavens glow with stars. And finally we shall discover that our rights embrace all the possible circumstances of man, moral, spiritual, and social, and having a meaning high as heaven, broad as the universe, and profound as eternity. 2.13 if we seek the origin and first beginning of the Masonic philosophy, we must go away back into the ages of remote antiquity, when we shall find this beginning in the bosom of kindred associations, where the same philosophy was maintained and taught. But if we confound the ceremonies of Masonry with the philosophy of Masonry, and see the origin of the institution, molded into outward form as it is today, we can scarcely be required to look further back than the beginning of the 18th century and, indeed, not quite so far. 214. I contend that the philosophy of Freemasonry is engaged in the contemplation of the divine and human character, of God as one eternal, self-existing being in contrast to the mythology of the ancient peoples, which was burdened with a multitude of gods and goddesses, of demigods and heroes, as man as an immortal being, preparing in the present life for an eternal future, and like contradiction to the ancient philosophy, 
which circumscribed the existence of man to the present life. 215. These two doctrines, then the unity of God and the immortality of the soul, constitute the philosophy of Freemasonry. When we wish to define it succinctly, we say that it is an ancient system of philosophy which teaches these two dogmas. 216. The fundamental law of Masonry requires only a belief in the supreme architect of the universe and in a future life, while it says, with peculiar tolerance, that in all other matters of religious belief, Masons are only expected to be of that religion in which all men agree, leaving their peculiar opinions to themselves. Under the shelter of this wise provision, the Christian and the Jew and the Mohammedan and the Brahmin are permitted to unite around our common altar, and Masonry becomes, in practice as well as in theory, universal. The truth is that Masonry is undoubtedly a religious institution, its religion being of that universal kind in which all men agree, and which, handed down through a long succession of ages from the ancient priesthood who first taught it, embraces the great tenets of the existence of God and the immortality of the soul, tenets which, by its peculiar symbolic language, it has preserved from its foundation, and still continues, in the same beautiful way, to teach. Beyond this, for its religious faith, we must not and cannot go. 217. Freemasonry does not profess to interfere with the religious opinions of its members. It asks only for a declaration of that simple and universal faith, in which men of all nations and all sects agree, the belief in a God and in his superintending providence. Beyond this, it does not venture, but leaves the minds of its disciples on other and sectarian points perfectly untrampled. This is the only religious qualification required by a candidate, but this is most strictly demanded. The religion, then, of Freemasonry is pure theism, on which its different members engraft their own peculiar opinions, but they are not permitted to introduce them into the lodge or to connect their truths or falsehoods with the truth of Masonry. 218. Every Mason says the Charters of 1722, is obligated by his tenure to obey the moral law. Now, this moral law is not to be considered as confined to the Decalogue of Moses, within which narrow limits these ecclesiastical writers technically restrain it, but rather as alluding to what is called Lex Nature, or the Law of Nature. This Law of Nature has been defined by an able, but not recent writer on this subject to be, the will of God, relating to human actions, grounded on the moral differences of things, and because discoverable by natural light, obligatory upon all mankind. This is the moral law to which the old charge already cited refers, and which it declares to be the law of masonry. And this was wisely done, for it is evident that no law less universal could have been appropriately selected for the government of an institution whose prominent characteristic is its universality. 219. The precepts of Jesus could not have been made obligatory on a Jew. A Christian would have denied the sanctions of the Quran. A Mohammedan must have rejected the law of Moses, and a disciple of Zoroaster would have turned from all to the teachings of his Zutavesta, the universal law of nature, which the authors of the old charges have properly called the moral law, because it is, as Coney Bear remarks, a perfect collection of all these moral doctrines and precepts, which have a foundation in the nature and reason of things, is therefore the only law suited in every respect to be adopted as the Masonic Code. 220. So broad is the religion of Masonry, and so carefully are all sectarian tenets excluded from the system that the Christian, the Jew, and the Mohammedan in all their numberless sects and divisions may and do harmoniously combine in its moral and intellectual work with the Buddhist, the Parsi, 
the Confucian, and the worshipper of deity under every form. 221. And why is this true? Because the Vishnu of the Brahmical Trinity, the Isis of the Egyptian, and the Holy Ghost of the Christian, and symbolized in the Roman Catholic Church by the Madonna, is the mother principle of every living thing in the universe. And when a man or woman has their spiritual mind awakened, they have a love for everything that lives and breathes, and they look on every object in nature and the outward manifestations of the divine living principle within. God is in all, and no matter at what shrine we worship, God is there. 222. The whole design of Freemasonry as a speculative science is the investigation of divine truths. To this great object, everything else is subsidiary. The Mason is, from the time of his initiation as an entered apprentice, to the time at which he receives the full fruition of Masonic light an investigator, a laborer in the quarry and the temple, whose reward is to be truth, and all the ceremonies and traditions of the order tend to be this ultimate design. In speculative Freemasonry, there is an advancement from a lower to higher state, from darkness to light, from death to light, from error to truth. 223 the Mason living and working in the world as his lodge must seek to raise himself out of it to that eminence which surmounts it where alone he can find divine truth. 224 Every speculative Mason is familiar with the fact that the East, as the source of material light, is a symbol of his own order which professes to contain within its bosom the pure light of truth. As in the physical world, morning of each day is ushered into existence by the red-leaning dawn of the eastern sky, whence the rising sun dispenses his illuminating and prolific rays to every portion of the visible horizon, warming the whole earth with his embrace of light and giving newborn life and energy to flowers and trees and beast and man, who, at the magic touch, awake from the sleep of darkness. So in the mortal world, when intellectual night was, in the earliest days, brooding over the world, it was from the ancient priesthood living in the East that these lessons of God, of nature, and of humanity first emanated, which, traveling westward, revealed to man his future destiny and his dependence on a superior power. Thus every new and true doctrine coming from these wise men of the East was, as it were, a new day rising and dissipating the clouds of intellectual darkness and error. It was a universal opinion among the ancients that the first learning came from the East, and a very true one, and the often quoted line of Bishop Barclay that, Westward, the course of empire takes its way, is but a modern utterance of an ancient thought, for it was always believed that the empire of truth and knowledge was advancing from east to west. 226. Mystic masonry, which naturally includes craft masonry, holds within itself the only true religion now in the world, that divine truth which guides man in his pilgrimage through life and confers on its initiates such knowledge and science that nothing more is required by the soul in its onward path. It is not only the repository of religion, but it holds the key of all religion. 227. Freemasonry itself anciently received, among other applications, that of lux or light, to signify that it is to be regarded as the sublime doctrine of divine truth, by which the path of him who has attained it is to be illuminated in his pilgrimage through life. 228. Light was, in accordance with the old religious sentiment, the great object of attainment in all the ancient religious mysteries. It was there, as it is now, in masonry, made the symbol of truth and knowledge. This was always its ancient symbolism, and we must never lose sight of this emblematic meaning when we are considering the nature and significance of Masonic light. 
229, in all the ancient systems this reverence for light as the symbol of truth was predominant. In the mysteries of every nation the candidate was made to pass, during his initiation, through scenes of utter darkness, and at length terminated his trials by an admission to the splendidly illuminated Sakellum, or sanctuary where he was said to have attained pure and perfect light, and where he received the necessary instructions which were to invest him with that knowledge of the divine truth, which it had been the object of all his labors to gain, and the design of the institution into which he had been initiated to be bestowed. 230. Light, therefore, becomes synonymous with truth and knowledge, and darkness with falsehood and ignorance. We find this symbolism pervading not only the institutions, but the very languages of antiquity. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider helping Wars of the Roses by donating through PayPal or Patreon. Links are in the description. Thank you very much.